All right, so everybody, welcome to the Future of HDR Live production presented by Leader. Uh, so glad to see all of you. Um, we did a pre-call last week, so we have a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to skip any kind of um, salutations for myself, just to say hello real quick and a quick introductions of everybody. We are joined by Chris Seeger, Office of the CTO, Director, Advanced Content Production Technology, NBC Universal. Chris, good to see you. How are you doing? Thank you very much. Michael Drazen, Director of Pro Production Engineering and Technology for NBC Olympics. Michael, good to see you again, as always. Good morning. Pablo Garcia Soriano, Color Supervisor, Managing Director for Chromorama. Pablo, how are you? Hi, everybody. Good. And Prin Boone, Product Manager for Simpty and Simpty Fellow for Fabrics. How are you, Prin? Great to see I'm you. I'm good, thanks. Good afternoon. We are, we are spanning the globe here, literally. And last but not least, Kevin Salvage, our co-host for this event, European Regional Development Manager for Leader. Kevin, how are you? I know you want to have a couple of words. To I'm very well. Thank you, Ken. So thank you everybody for joining us. So at Leader, we've been involved in monitoring and analyzing high dynamic range from the outset. And like many commentators, we see HDR significantly enhancing the consumer experience, especially when it comes to live events. As with all new technologies, managing the transition brings its own set of unique challenges. Whilst HDR is the new kind of shiny toy on the block, we must not forget that the vast majority of consumers are currently watching standard dynamic range and it's SDR productions that are paying the broadcasters and the OB companies bills. So this cannot be compromised. So fortunately, the panel we've assembled for today's seminar also have been involved in HDR production, many for probably more years than they care to remember. So this year, we'll be involved in delivering a number of major live sporting events in both HDR and SDR. So without more ado, Ken, let's let the panel tell us how they're gonna do it this summer. Yeah, sure. So we're gonna start with some quick opening comments and then we're gonna have three presentations, which actually can be really great because they're gonna show three different perspectives uh, and approaches for HDR. So it'd be a good opportunity to compare and contrast. Um, I wanted to begin with uh, Mr. Drazen. I'm gonna begin with you. Um, I saw you at the Super Bowl, obviously, last year with, with Fox, and you were working on some HDR projects there, um, which was amazing. I know you're, you're, you've worked on a lot of HDR projects over the years at CBS and NBC. Um, what's your take as far as the general state of HDR, where we stand for live sports production in, in terms of maturity? I think that we're there, actually. We've, you know, as, as you just said, I've seen you through a whole bunch of HDR stuff starting, uh, you know, testing things at various golf events all the way through to Fox's Super Bowl two years ago. And I think the being able to do that Super Bowl uh, and a Super Bowl level production with every bell and whistle that everything gets thrown at that, as well as the integration with all the different other international uh, participants in that compound and being able to share content. And uh, it just shows that we're there, we can execute it. We don't have, you know, there aren't any major barriers to entry to being able to do, you know, even the biggest shows in the planet. Right, right. So wait, who's who's popped on behind you? Your dogs? Who's that? Yeah, all the dogs are here. <laughs> Very cute. All right. Hey, Prince. So from your perspective, um, how, you know, how do how do you see the state of HDR? I completely agree with Michael. Um, I think actually, I mean, it's 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 great to see you guys because we've known each other for on off donkey's years, and I think all of us here have actually made every mistake in the book while writing the book. I think it's fair to say. Um, the, there's, a, there's a long and checked history of every combination of experiment and add-on and the like we've done, for my part, going back to Valencia Motor GP in 2014 is when we did the first live um, HDR acquisition at the time. Um, four years ago, Cardiff UEFA Champions League final, which with apologies to our American colleagues, we claim is the world's largest um, one-day sporting event is, yes. <laughs> for a TV audience. Um, <laughs> Um, was an, a massive HDR add-on, uh, which had, had live streaming um, to, um, to set-top boxes, televisions, and even to a, um, a laser cinema. Um, and we've been live with um, a single unified production in a way that um, Chris and uh, the, li the guys have evolved uh, more recently. We went live two years ago with, with BT Sport in their ultimate branded content with Atmos. So uh, I think that is still in Europe the only regular service, uh, event-based, albeit it is, but we've got to the point now where they've done eight 
at events in five days. We're still a small fleet of trucks going around. And these are all, all major English Premier League and UEFA uh, type events. So it's, it's routine. Yeah, sure. And Chris, from, from your perspective? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Print and I actually worked in 2016 on a camera shootout for the Macy's Fireworks. And that was our first venture into, that was fun. <laughs> uh, into HDR. And we had three different camera manufacturers participating in it, um, you know, followed by Rio and uh, a number of Notre Dame seasons. And during each of those events, we've made every mistake in the book, as Prin said. And we've, you, you know, we finally realized that we really had to come up with objective metrics. We had to come up with a way uh, that we could measure um, the conversions and decide how we were going to be. We were going to be able to merge these two production styles of HDR and SDR. And uh, partnering with with Michael and Pablo as well, we've we've been able to reconcile all these these different pieces and into you know the multiple deliverables and and so. We've, we've finally got in, gotten into a, a decent state at this point in 2021. So quite a number of years. All right, excellent, great. So Pablo, your perspective, and then obviously you're gonna kick us off as far as your presentation. So um, maybe you can do uh, it at the same time, but. Well, my, my view on it, it's, uh, it has, uh, it was born, it was started to grow up and I think it has matured. Uh, I've been involved in HDR before these standards came along, I think it was 20, 2015 when I was working at mm -hmm. Sony and the first prototype of the X300 of the Sony monitor was sent to me from Japan for me to test it and to see what this new thing was. Because people need to understand that HDR is, is not a look, it's, not, um, it's just a new display technology that we are dealing with. Uh, we've been able to capture HDR in the cinematography side mostly uh, since the late 50s, 60s. Back then, the latitude of a, of a good negative was uh, already about 14 and a half, 15, uh, 15 stops. So the only bottleneck was displaying it. So uh, from the days of uh, 2018, uh, 20, well, 2017, 2016 is when I really got involved into television and HDR because I'm former more from the, coming from the cinematography side uh, with uh, the preparations for the World Cup in, uh, in Russia, which I had the pleasure to supervise and to figure out <laughs> because that's, that was a little bit, um, yeah, it was, it was purely rock and roll. Uh, nobody really knew how to how to achieve how to do it um, and regarding all the presentation that I have uh, as I said I don't really want to hijack I have a hell of a lot of content that I can share but um, I think it would be interesting to to talk a little bit I'm not going to really talk about workflows I'm going to talk about two projects that I'm going to talk about Russia and another one that is happening this summer in uh, Asia uh, that Michael and Chris will be uh, over there. And um, mostly why we decided to do in both of them uh, a scene referred uh, approach, um, explaining scene light and display light uh, within the color science world. It's, a it's, it's the most common topic that you talk about it. Where is the workflow and which part are you in and so on for television and for uh, for broadcasters, I think is a really novel thing and uh, there's a lot of confusion about it. So I'm going to try to explain it as quickly as possible, but well, as quickly as possible. Trying to make it myself as clear as possible and trying to throw a little bit of light on uh, not in how it's defined in the BT2408, but how is defined by color science, which is very similar to how it's defined in the in the IT recommendation. Great. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, I'm going to share the. I was going to go for full presentation in my presenter notes, but uh, I'm going to share with you the whole the whole thing. And I'm going to look in this side. If you see me looking at this, it's because I got like four different screens. <laughs> so first of all, we need to understand. Um, what is linear light? 
and what is perceptual like what is uh, from the scene to the main display that we have which is inside of our brains and how light actually moves from and how it travels and how it's understood for example if uh, if many of you is using color charts uh, and you're familiar with the concept of the 18 percent gray or mid gray it is nothing but the linear representation of the reflective light of a, of a gray patch, which only reflects the 18% of it. But it is perceived as a, a midpoint between diffuse white and diffuse black for us. When you put them all of them together, you see them as, or you perceive them, but I said, as a, as, a, um, as a step in between, but literally it's only the point 18 of the incident light that is hitting that gray patch. That said, in looking at this graph that I have here, this is, for example, one of the reasons why when you put a card and you capture it by, um, by the book, Rec 709 camera, it falls exactly on 41% because that's the way that it was defined, the 2.2. Uh, actually 0.45 camera. So we have here another way of uh, of using it. Uh, I recommend, I mean, I I use color charts constantly and uh, I think it's the one of the best way. Uh, Chris is gonna talk about metrics afterwards. For me, this is the best way for metrics and uh, for getting what a camera is actually doing. And I've been using DSC Labs for a long time. And in here, for example, you have a representation of uh, where the should fall more or less when you do it everything by the book okay because then we have creative intents uh, and so on so this is the very early stages of going from what is actual a scene light because light is actually a linear representation is the amount of light that is hidden uh, an object but the amount of light that um, that a light source is creating uh, etc then how do we move into into the scene referred and display referred so it's a high fidelity representation of the full dynamic range from the original that is a scene referred workflow or picture or part of the workflow because workflows they always move from scene to display what we have in a display referred is about the amount of light that is created on the display side, which it's again linear light. A display, it's sent into our eyes because our eyes, they need linear light to be understood. They need to basically recreate. And then is when we go for the concept of uh, gamma and inverse gamma. One cancels each other and you get back a linear representation of the, of the facsimile of the, of the actual nature. Um, so, a scene refer or a scene light workflows, um, and so on. let me see if I can find a bit more on to, okay. Cameras will capture all sensors, by the way, are linear. They see linear light. Sensors are intrinsically linear. We always applied afterwards uh, either an EOTF or a log encoding and so on which is just basically um, to optimize the the bit depth and the uh, just to make it a little bit lighter because linear light is quite heavy in, in bit depth that represents that creates already a, a scene refer uh, picture depending on the EOTF that we're using and then we'll be using an OETF to go back to linear but within the limitations of the display we got linear light, but we don't have the same we captured. So it's been all that path that we've been following. Uh, in terms of the BT21, uh, sorry, uh, 2408, and what we're talking about is scene light and display light conversions. Um, and a scene light conversion will always try to replicate what was on these first side of this graphic. A display light conversion will be within the limitations of the display that we're talking about, we'll try to move or to have that creative intent or that exact same look in 
uh, in another color space. Uh, principles of color uh, color transforms is that literally you can any color space or gamut can be transformed into another one within the limitations of the maths and within the limitations of the uh, of the native material that you have. You can it's easier to destroy than to create, all right? So yeah, conversions of SDR. Um, in nearly any cases, in all cases, a piece of content is going to need to be converted somehow. And we've been dealing with that for 40 odd years. Um, the same grading knobs or the same master blacks or etc., depending on the content that you're working on or your working space, are going to have different results. That's also pretty logic. Um, and in any image pipeline, color space normally gets progressively smaller as we move to the delivery. And this is one of the reasons why we decided to go scene referred in Russia. We actually went full scene reserve uh, um, because we were using uh, SLOG3 in that case. Because I was, I was put that we had to do SDR, HLG, PQ, and SLOG3 deliverables. So we have four different deliverables from, um, from a capture. The only real way to, to do it was coming in, to my experience, it was to come from a fully scene referred um, OETF, which is SLOG3. Then we have in that gray area, hybrid log gamma, which for some people is a scene referred from some, from some other people is display referred, and it really much depend on where you're looking at it. And then we have PQ, which is 100% uh, display referred workflow. Um, things that we need to consider when um, when doing conversions, um, it's how we manage our um, our highlight handling, especially when we're coming from smaller color spaces from SDR up to HDR, you can fake it really well. You can, uh, but you need a really good SDR as a base. You need extremely well tone mapped uh, SDR to fit it in the best way possible. So that's where uh, advanced tone mapping and um, two stages uh, of, uh, of knee applied and things like this will help a lot. Knee helps, but very little because of the nature of, of how the knee operates and how it's actually staged within the light encoding, you need something with a way more roll-off. And that's one of the reasons why uh, LUTs are being the, the go-to for now. And I think I'm going to move it because I can just get four hours uh, <laughs> talking about, because I, I want to reserve a few of these ones because I have some of our uh, perceptual phenomena uh, but that's going to be when Michael talks about monitors and uh, how do we actually should be looking at monitors and so on. Um, yeah, so I think that's for me. That's me for now. Uh, going to send it back to you for a second. Thanks, Pablo. That's great. All right, Prin, you're on deck. So um, well, real, real quick, anybody for Prin, Chris, and Mike, any thoughts on what Pablo said? Anything that stood out with you? Stood out? from his presentation. So, well, I think um, I'm gonna build on that actually, on those core principles that Pablo's uh, outlined. Great. And, um, and while Pablo was doing the, the work in Russia, um, Muggins over here was kind of, uh, we were trying to figure out the same, same piece actually. Um, what Pablo has been doing though, was for, for, for as, a, as an international host um, and as a kind of a one-off event where they they build the whole thing, put it together, and then they can they can tear it down afterwards. And so the so the design decisions and the equipment practice you can use and and how you um, split up the, the buses on the on the on the vision mix and the, the switches and the like, are, can be very very different. You have many many more degrees of freedom um, and the latitude of what you can do for that event, as opposed to trying to do this on a day in day out where you have got trucks which can be one HDR gig in every two weeks and then the rest of the time they're running in, in SDR and you're, you're trying to adapt that and you've got a mixture of crews, you're, you're trying to run an operation um, with wet and dry hire. So you've got a, um, a whole different bunch of 
constraints and that's what we were kind of trying to do in the UK with the same equipment ironically um, but very very different application um, and so what what we ended up doing you can see here and uh, this is a, a presentation which I gave with them with Andy Beale this is permission of BT Sport here as the work we did to launch that ultimate channel which is in HDR and, and Atmos uh, so the um, the 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 decisions we had to make were basically, you know, you have to be able to deliver an experience of differentiation from SDR, single truck centric. We've done all the add-ons. Some of the stadiums we go to, there isn't room to get an extra truck on there. Um, so you, you just can't do that, especially in, in England where we're a pretty crowded um, island here. Minimal impact on OPEX or logistics. Um, the, the SDR deliverables, there are contractual obligations. If everyone's been involved in this, you know, you get a, you get a book of what all the graphics are supposed to be. And, and um, it's a very interesting conversation when you mess up the graphics and, and the, the team colors and the like, and, uh, and the flags, so these are, these are important. Um, so you, you must cannot compromise those. It's got to be 10-bit 42 infrastructure. We can't redesign broadcasts for 12 bits or RGB. That's not um, how we've done that. And, the, the format that they chose was was based on choice of receiving devices, which for BT Sports was app based. So it was to phones and mobiles as part of their partnership with, with EE. Um, there was apps on Samsung televisions, uh, PlayStation, Xbox, um, Fire Stick and the like. So in, for distribution, they chose PQ and, and or HDR10. In fact, it's, it's, there's no done metadata with that. But for the production format, as Pablo talked about, you've got four choices um, in, in practice. I mean, you could go Cinelog or some of the others. So, and we, we evaluated camera systems from, from Grass Valley um, running in, in, in PQ uh, and sometimes HLG, and also Sony cameras as well within uh, running SL Live, in fact, rather than SLog3, and also HLG. We kind of quickly um, actually did not use, decided not to use HLG because at the time, the let's call it the natural look of HLG was not very commercially compelling. It wasn't the sports look that they had today. So we went with, um, with, um, with a choice of PQSR Live. And ultimately, due to a whole bunch of reasons of which HDR was not a strong uh, factor, um, the contract was awarded to a, um, a host provider who, who used Sony cameras. That's why we ended up in the S-Log3 um, um, uh, camp. And we still have, but we still have the choice of, you know, do we contribute to S-Log3 or PQ? And, and today, it's, it's a mixture, it depends on what you pick up. Um, last week, somebody picked up um, the S-Log3 feed um, um, with the, as you turn around um, and was faced with trying to convert it to HLG using uh, LUTs. Uh, unfortunately, the LUTs they had were designed for uh, scene light, not display light and had the wrong HDR gain offset. So there's a, a host of complications come from that and Pablo's laughing because he knows what I'm talking about. So, um, and in, in terms of actually running an event, the trucks roll in on, on Riggers are on Thursday, trucks are on Friday. Um, the um, production team are there on Saturday morning and woe betide if you're not, not ready for the production facts check at one o'clock um, or, or um, at, at T minus two. You cannot change that. And so the only change we tweaked in there uh, was, was to try to make sure there's an HDR facts check um, on match day minus one as part of that setup. So that was kind of a requirement of how we went through. So English Premier League football, this we did, they do this day in, day out. There's a lot of deliverables on there. So you've got a, a program feed in UHD HDR as also um, uh, 25i SDR, world feeds um, in UHD and, and HD, English Premier League ISOs. So the Premier League productions take an ISO every single camera. Um, you've got third party feeds on, on the stadium. You've got to send um, feeds to VAR for the um, referee uh, replay of the time. And also you've got um, stuff going to studio. We now have studio productions as well, bounce in and out of there and you've got HDR cameras pointing at LED walls and all the lighting. So, so we've been through the whole gamma to what you have to do to bring a, a full system together. And we could not have done this before 2019. Um, it was only in 2019 that the technology came available across a whole range of pieces. We'd, we'd done the live events two years before, but we couldn't do RFs, we couldn't do replays at the time. And um, I remember looking at the four hours we did of the Cardiff production and only 60 minutes of that of that four hours is actually in HDR. We kind of went, that doesn't really work. And it was, in, but in 2019, all this became available, the Steadicams, RFs, Spiders, um, 
okay, the old, the old poles and reverse angles are still in, it's in SDR cameras, but the speciality uh, technical cameras, but, but the rest of it, you can, you can now make the whole lot HDR and it transforms the, um, the look of the program. If you can, please, please, please do make your RFs and your replays and your super slow-mos in HDR because you, your eye lingers over the super slow-mo and you can see all the detail lovingly shot by today's, as Pablo talks about, modern cameras in UHD deliver 12, 13 stops and the, and the high def um, two thirds inch sensors will give you 15 stops. So we, we do a very high quality TV cameras today. And you get HDR capable graphics and processors. So Delta Tray now routinely provide HDR graphics to, to UEFA as well, which um, is unusual. We did a lot of events and these aren't kind of minor events. We started in it with a, within the, the run, crawl, walk, run type approach. We started out on, on, on minor leagues and then and moved up, but we did, um, you know, World Cup finals, FA Cup finals, Premier League, um, Champions League finals, Community Shields, and all. So these are all major, major sporting events in Europe. These are, and these are all the final led up to the launch of the 2019 um, Champions League final in uh, Madrid. And um, and and the the fact the YouTube feed, the SDR feed, was that was derived from the HDR service that we did at the time. And then we went live with, um, or BT Sport went live with. Um, uh, ultimate um, in, in in August for the uh, uh, Charity Shield at Wembley. So how do we do it? Truck adaptions. So these are things basically to do uh, to the trucks. Uh, you can't flip a whole truck to HDR and leave it that. It's got to be useful and flexible. Replay codecs and RF cameras, you have to move to 10 bits. So there's a hit on there. Again, in 2019, we got the point where you could sacrifice the channels on the replays and, and they got small if you could fit them more in, in the truck again. Um, HCR vision monitor supervisor position had to be put in place. So his, um, um, I'm a Liverpool fan, so uh, you'll see a lot of Liverpool footage on <laughs> all these pieces. Um, production stack was ad adapted and Michael will talk about as well, fax checks. And the other thing about racking is in HDR, there's so much exposure latitude, you don't need really to change the iris, but we are still monitoring and, and deriving an SDR feed in the way I'll talk about. So you need to rack slow. You can't rack iris aggressively because it looks very, very strange in the HDR service. It may look normal in SDR to the SDR viewer, but the HDR viewer is going, why did you do that? It, it looked fine to me. I don't need to, need to change that. Um, so this is the HDR vision supervisor before the, the trucks were fully adapted. Um, you can see um, all the bits, bits and pieces. I was dragging equipment along and um, we were plumbing everything in. That then condensed into what's on the right, a very nice feed here. So this is, these trucks are originally designed for stereoscopic 3D operation. And so there was a spare rack in there. And, and this is the adaption for the rack. So you can see all the shader positions on the right and, and how the HDR vision supervisor positions there. There's one of those BVMX 300s that uh, Pablo talked about at the bottom uh, um, and some multi views at the top. And you can see the output of, the, of, the, of our rasterizer there. Um, one of the other tricks we did is because we're transmitting in PQ, so in fact, this is my phone looking at the reverse feed of the, the Tottenham Liverpool game uh, on a Tuesday night at UEFA. So we, I'm literally taking the um, 4G service back uh, from, from EE um, um, and, and running the app on my phone. So you, that's actually a surprisingly good way of getting a re reverse feed of what's going on. It does actually work. Um, and we had one of those in Madrid as well, which is uh, quite interesting. So we talked a lot about shaders. So for those who aren't familiar, Meet the shaders. Um, word of advice: Don't feed them after midnight. Um, so there's a the, the real, it's a very confined area in the truck. Um, but you, we, we used to these phones where you just point and click and everything shoots. But in multi-camera production, there are still these highly trained people who determine your entire look of your program and are manipulating these very, very complex control panels. Um, some of people only can only look at one or two cameras in, in football. You know, one person looking at camera one, camera two. Others in different genres may be controlling eight cameras at the same time and, and balancing all these up live. And so there's a whole team of those um, and there's a, vision, there's a vision supervisor looking after the, the whole, whole of them all. And what we came down to in order to minimize the impact and meet all of the requirements that we talked about was we, we developed this technique called closed loop shading. Um, and where the shaders continue to shade in, in SDR, there's, there's actually no change for them. They hate it because they're going, what's this interesting stuff around the corner? And can I have a look at it, please? And can I have a monitor? And, we, and so, um, unfortunately, they just carry on doing their job. They, it makes no difference to them, um, although they do have to manage the HDR side as well. So 
basically we have a, an HDR production of which we derive SDR from this. We don't have a parallel production, it's not an add-on. And the, the idea is that fundamentally you um, take the sources from the cameras, sometimes you have an SDR output, sometimes you don't, so you map it. In this particular Sony workflow, it's a scene, as Pablo talked about, it's a scene referred um, conversion, or should I say a conversion by a scene light is, is what we really mean. And then you take the output and you down map that as well to SDR. So when the camera OCP touches down, then that switches from the uh, transmission to their local camera and they're, to, they're comparing two SDR feeds, which have been both derived from HDR. So that's the closed loop that we're putting there. Now, Phil, um, Chris refers to this as the indicative down mapper uh, in his systems. And that's the, um, this is kind of, this is the reference HDR to SDR converter in, this, in, the, in the chain. So why do this? Because what you see is what you get. You know exactly what you're doing. Um, nothing else changes. SDR exposure is critical. We talked about shading slow in it. Um, there's an experiment done where some rugby in California was shot constant iris at F8. They set up the cameras the day before. It's California, right? Sunshine was the next day was the same as the day before. And um, and um, and apart from when they, they went into the, in the shade line and the, the scrum was a little bit dark, you almost didn't need to do anything. In the UK, we did a FA Cup quarterfinal where it starts out with bright sunshine with the shade line. It went hazy, it went cloudy, it starts to rain, it started, it then sleeted, it snowed, and then it then it reversed itself all the way back to sunshine in the case of 90 minutes. And you have to manage that constantly all the while. And then the SDR is, is, is critical. Um, so we, you may be adjusting HDR camera controls and monitoring SDR, um, but the shade itself has no change. Shade slow. And how, what, how does that affect the truck? Now, um, Pablo has talked about these conversions. When you apply them to the workflow of an English Premier League truck with all those deliverables I talked about earlier, this is what it kind of looks like in the end. And so everything in um, with all the blue lines, are kind of S-Log3 um, signal paths, and the yellow is the SDR content that's coming in from packages and, and um, Piero and all that kind of kind of stuff or studio feeds. Um, we have graphics um, and then we have to convert the final SLOG3 output via SR Live, the display preferred conversion, to PQ for contribution and, and transmission. Um, and these are the various points in the chain where we did that. There are different ways of architecting this. We, we've got it wrong many times, and this is the, the simplest adaptation to the trucks that we, we, could, we could figure out that would work day in, day out and go with the flow and the grain of, 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 of the workflow that people have been used today. And, and, and um, so one got you with this course is that we've got this scene referred conversion here, or, but we have a display referred or conversion by display light here. This output will not match that because of these two different technologies. And that's a consequence of the technology we're using at the time. Chris has got a different solution. He can talk about that. Um, downstream, we are now contributing PQ and uh, well, sometimes S-Log3 if you pick up international um, as you turn around. And there are a number of different HDR to SDR converters downstream. As it's PQ, you can just put it on a conventional television. Uh, the you know, modern Samsung or HLG is extremely, makes extremely good preview monitor. Um, even with default settings, it's, it's quite amazing um, um, the improvements in domestic technology. Um, or you can use a, a grade one BVMX300. Um, and what we do is also take a return feed from Red B. So in fact, we're deriving SDR transmission actually at Red B on, on premises there, and then take the return feed back to the truck if necessary, because ultimately the only person in the entire chain who knows what it should look like is the HDR vision supervisor in the truck. MCR no longer understand what it should look like. And that's a huge change actually in, in quality assessment. We even had MCR complaining that um, the HDR feed was going above 200 nits because 2048 said diffuse white was at 200 nits. And that was a four hour argument, which had to be solved by um, the, 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 C, the, the CTO <laughs> to, to calm everybody down and explain what it goes on. But we're so used to having white be the clip point and you can't go above white. You know, it's, it's, it, um, so there's a whole raft of concepts that need to get over and, and training. So uh, closure chain and SDR done mappers talked about that conclusions. The, the technique works for any HDR format. You, know, you can run C-Log or everything else through that. that it's, it's fundamentally 
um, independent of the, the HDR format you're using. It's robust evolution in camera controls. Grass Valley got some extremely innovative um, OCPs and the like that they've done on, on, on their cameras. Um, and it, it, it works with the, all the concepts that they're, they're, they're bringing to the party. Uh, it works for both HDR RS and mine cameras. Um, it's camera independent. Um, and so it means that I, I implore anybody who's doing this to use this technique as the foundation of what you want to do and then build on that um, um, output. Now, you can argue that um, you are kind of anchoring yourself to this SDR look, and, and but ultimately, if you have an SDR deliverable, you've got to be able to, to guarantee that. And this is the simplest way we found of doing it. Now, the converters in the system may have different requirements. We talked about um, a future event um, in, in Asia coming up. Um, a couple of years ago when they looked at this, some of the converters they were talking about using weren't even lead compliant in Europe. You couldn't even buy them in Europe. So that the chances of being able to use the same converter in two places is negligible. Um, two and a half years ago, we looked at LUTs as well. We couldn't find a LUT with tetrahedral interpolation um, that had the right bit depth. So we were constrained to use the, 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 altern, the, the current techniques at the time. Um, so nowadays, modern implementations are many more degrees of freedom. That's how we did it um, a couple of years ago. Now, there are some core concepts as well that are new. HDR gain offset is, thing, is applied. Um, 2048 implies a, a 6 dB gain offset. Um, and in fact, we done did a lot of work. And at the time, it wasn't clear what, what was the appropriate one to use because of the, the Millwall FA Cup um, event of the sunshine to snow and back again, we chose an extremely conservative or selected seems to gain architecture whereby um, we had a 3 dB gain offset, it's 141% in linear uh, light as Pablo talked about. And that's where we set um, graphics peak white in HDR and that's what's mapped down to 100% in SDR. Now, that does meet contractual uh, requirements today where graphics white is 100%, but it means there's no headroom left in SDR and that's all clipped out. That, that's, that's what you get today. Chris will talk about um, uh, ways different way of doing it. But you do get specular highlights, um, certainly out of a, a UHD camera, which um, could go up to 1800 nits on there. Um, you can't display that. None of the displays we use will go that far, but they exist in the, in the, in the coding space. And this is kind of a, a mock-up of the histogram between SDR and HDR that you get. And you see there are these areas here, which statistically don't happen very often. Um, I mean, this one's quite more prevalent, um, but the speculars, there aren't actually really that many in a scene. And, and quite often, uh, if you've got a floodlit ground, then, um, then the, it's quite a narrow uh, dynamic range in, in those types of scenes. Um, so lots of people use different um, gain offsets today, um, although six is, is, I think, what we probably need to move towards. Um, UEFA use NEG5, at the moment we're using NEG3. Um, Dorna wanted, chose NEG10 um, when in, we're in Silverstone. Um, so, um, the, you have to work with all that. Um, implementing it with different equipment was complicated. Everybody has their own way of describing how their color proc amps use. So I had to go through and figure out all the different settings, all the gear. And Pablo's talked about senior display referred. When do you use it? There are some recommendations there as to which may or may not be appropriate. Pablo has got a different approach, but oh, you talk about graphics and program, but what do you do when you've got a mixture of program and graphics and a studio feed? And, the, and the, these cameras use standard gamma two, not standard gamma five, because there's a studio clipped out dark look. So they're using a completely different set of settings that's used for the studio feeds as, as for live feeds. You also get conversion and compression to concatenation. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind is that 10 bit HDR is fragile. You really do to mimic, you re, sorry, you really need to minimize the number of conversions that you do, because as Pablo talked about, you will get build up a quantization errors through the system. And then very briefly, here's an RGB test pattern. I did not fake this. Um, so this is Claire Balding. She turned up in a bright scarlet coat um, against green grass um, at Brighton Seagulls. And you can look on the CIE chart as to how saturated those colors were in a CIE chart in, in reality. So, um, you know, you have to process all of this and be, be aware of it. And, and then uh, again, the people can talk about the um, hue invariance, the processing, you don't want to clip in RGB to get brown clouds and likes. And so just be very careful with how you evaluate converters and make sure they're right for your genre and your lighting conditions and the variability of, of what you want to get out there. So that's, that's, that's it for me. That's 
Excellent. Thanks, Prin. So Chris and Mike, as far as, um, would you like to share some thoughts and slides? Yeah. And uh, far away. So there's an interesting note in that um, Prin says he's uh, preserving 1800 nits in HLG. And the cool thing is, and what we do on the NBC side is we convert from, H, from HLG to PQ. So we can preserve the overshoot above 1000 nits in HLG into the PQ output that gets to the consumer. So let's say they have a Visio that's capable of uh, uh, 2,400 nits. We could actually preserve that peak brightness that's been, um, uh, it, that came from the original shoot all the way to the consumer. And as displays get, more, uh, get brighter, there are different things that we're gonna be able to do through that workflow. And I think S-Log3 might be able to preserve even more than uh, than 1800 nits, although the broadcast cameras likely can't do that just no, yet. No, that, that, that was, a we were running SLOG 3 and 1800 was the limit uh, and we, we could get out of a, a 12 stop camera at the time. Yeah, so hopefully uh, there's, there's something, you know, the broadcast cameras uh, will improve. And then one final note on the recommendations in ITU's BT2408, there's a simple table that uh, gives you recommendations on when to use display referred or scene referred for certain sources and outputs. So I think that's a good transition to Ken. Do you want us to go through our the presentation of yeah, kind of sure. what NBC has been working on? Feel free. Okay. Yeah, just one me... just so well while you're doing that, just one comment on the on the cameras. If you if you dig out an LDX86, which is a high def sensor, um, you can get 3,600 nits or more uh, at, at, at zero dB uh, standard because as as they're bigger, bigger photo sites. Hopefully everybody can see uh, the, the slide at this point. Yep. 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 Michael, it's all yours. Next slide there, Chris. So like we talked about, you know, at the beginning and each, you know, each group, We've all kind of started, you know, this team started back in 2015 and kind of transitioned through a whole bunch of events. And we've all made a bunch of, you know, decisions each event. Uh, we've tried things, some things have worked well, some things have haven't. So we really call it our evolution of where we were to where we are today. And a lot of the decisions we've made really are driven by our philosophy. And our philosophy is, you know, we need to keep this simple, it needs to be repeatable. Uh, content created in SDR needs to look the same way in HDR, where our feeling that, you know, as you transition from a 709 boundary to a 2020 boundary, you're, everything that exists in 709 shall still be represented the same way in HDR and then should come back to SDR the same way. So that, that uh, is one of the core principles are, of our philosophy. And the other one was we did a lot of, you know, trials with our shaders and shading in the environments, looking at, you know, the CCUs, what we got out of the HDR side of the CCUs and the SDR side of the CCU. So we'll talk about that in a second. And I, I think the, the biggest thing of what it took to get from where we are to where, you know, where we're going was really a collaboration throughout the industry, including, you know, Pablo and his partner, Nick, um, our, our colleagues at the BBC and kind of everywhere else. And we've created a set of LUTs that we're now sharing with the industry as a whole. And without the set of LUTs, uh, we wouldn't be where we are. And so this is kind of the obligatory slide. Don't expect you to read the whole thing and we'll share it, but there is a link in here that can get you to the entire LUT package. We've made it available to vendors as well as everybody in the industry. And as well as a, a whole set of documentation that goes into some more detail than we're going to go into today. So, and the whole goal is to get everybody to be able to work together the same way we do today. Nobody thinks about sharing SDR content from uh, entity to entity. So uh, we need to get there in HDR. And this is what, you know, we feel is a first step to get there. It's just make them totally publicly available and then ask people if you came up with something better, you have a different suggestion to, you know, continue the co collaboration. So for us, we really looked at our productions and uh, when, you know, this is kind of the big picture overview and the focus was to keep it simple and convert to HLG HDR. Uh, the choice of HLG BT2100 was really because 
you can't guarantee all the tools in your production. And you had to have the single uh, format that was compatible across every vendor. So the, the only one that works across, you know, whether it's your smallest camera manufacturers or your big ones, your graphics manufacturers, your AR VR guys, everything all played together at that like common point. Um, and so we use that format. We're essentially only using three LUTs in our production environment. We use a scene referred LUT only for cameras so that, you know, we are working with our shaders. We felt that was the closest way to match SDR cameras into an HDR environment. Then everything else that we do, we do in HDR and we use display referred. Uh, so once we have our, our finished uh, HDR production, as Chris mentioned, the, we also have a LUT that converts that to PQ, which then hands it off to our master control and distribution for the rest of the workflows. So as Chris steps to the next slide, as we mentioned earlier, like our uh, productions are, you know, I, I, I don't want to say complicated, but there's a, a lot of different variables that come into our productions. And there was no way we were going to be able to sell this initiative to production without and, and tell them, oh, so, you know, you want to, we want to do this, but now you have to do it without something. So we work through every iteration, whether it's, you know, cameras and replays, graphics, virtual enhancements, um, whether those virtual enhancements are on site or off site editing. And we really work through the whole thing to come up with a plan to how we do the whole thing in HDR. And we also made the decision at the time to do it as a single stream production so that, you know, we weren't doing like, I'll be honest, I looked at print slides and like, I don't know that I could execute that production at scale or repeatably uh, with like all our regional networks and other places with all the HDR and SDR. And so we really looked at this as uh, keep it, you know, keep it simple, keep it straightforward. And then, so on the, all the sources on this diagram around the left, on the right side is kind of the execution. And you can see like replays are all HDR. I mean, a lot of our productions live in replay. Uh, multi viewers, we feed just about everything HDR. Um, uh, there's our transmission to PQ. And then we're gonna talk about shading in a little more detail in a second. Uh, so the second part of what drove us to our own LUT solution was everything in our file-based workflows in our SDR environments could not be abandoned. So anything that was hardware only or could only be replicated in hardware was a non-starter for us. So whether it's TD elements or archive content, everything had to match and everything had to match whether it was baseband or file-based. So Chris... Next slide, I think we're going to talk about shading and shading. It, it's really like, I guess it's one of the most important parts of doing this. And then working with our shaders, they, they were given the opportunity to shade in SDR, to shade in HDR. We're pretty much a single source manufacturer here domestically in the US of the cameras that we're seeing. So Chris, go back a slide. Thank you. So the, the decision we've arrived at is the the shaders work in HDR and we use what we call a predictive uh, down convert so they can see what it looks like in SDR. So in general, they have, you know, an HDR version of the camera and the SDR uh, derived from the LUT next to them. And you, to be honest, you give them like an hour maybe, and they kind of get that relationship between HDR and SDR. And we give them an opportunity to push open the iris as Prince said, and like, you see where the knee starts to, you know, take effect and what they can and can't get away with. And they kind of build that relationship. And then we see that they really learn and pick it up. And that SDR predictive gets put on program and it just stays there the rest of the show. And they just shade in HDR. Um, they have scopes on both sides. Uh, SDR sources, like we mentioned earlier, this is our one use of the scene referred LUT. And we turn it into HDR and they shade it like the rest of the cameras and make it match. So what we have found is we actually don't use the SDR outputs of the CCUs. So the SDR and the HDR outputs, even you know, coming out of the CCU didn't match. So we've made the decision that we put conversion in place and use our LUT anywhere that we need a derived SDR. And for us, and the number of cameras that each one of the shaders had to look after, it just wasn't operationally feasible to be able to get to both sides. And we didn't have, there aren't space in the trucks to add another, and there was no appetite from production to add another person shading cameras. Um, 
So this was this is our solution, and so far um, we've pretty much so battle tested and feel very good about it. And uh, Chris, if you go back, I got one more thing on that. So the other thing we've made a decision that our SDR reference displays, as Chris calls out here, is to at 203 nits. So when we set our anchor point at 75% in HDR, which is 203 nits, that gives us a very consistent crossover between our HDR and SDR, and that's why it's so easy for our video guys to shade. The last thing I'll add on this is this workflow also works if your video guys are shading in SDR, they shade through the predictive light. So we've had shows where shading is all done in SDR because the primary show is SDR utilizing HDR assets. They'll shade those HDR cameras through the LUT and then we'll have other unilateral HDR only cameras being shaded in HDR. And we haven't had a single problem matching those two environments together. And the really the, it goes back to that core, that NBCU LUT3 is what enables that to happen. Having that consistency of a single LUT, single conversion between HDR and SDR and everybody working through the same thing. What's next, Chris? Yeah, so here's a, a quick description of our LUTs, the, the three that are SDR to HDR in the HLG space. And really our focus on our LUTs was to maintain the artistic intent between SDR to HDR and then HDR back to SDR. A lot of our content has you know, commercial aspects to it and a lot of stuff is sponsored. So if we had a sponsor watching an HDR and the colors of their logo were not correct in HDR, they weren't gonna be happy. So it had to be correct in the SDR version, in the HDR version, and then in the SDR derived version. So, and if anybody has questions, obviously ask us more and we're happy to get into this a little more. And then on our next slide, uh, this is the LUT that we mentioned that we use to get to, uh, to get to PQ for distribution and out to the rest of the world. So we, you know, we've tried to put this entire package together to deliver uh, to the entire industry. On the next slide, we have a quick example of what happens when you don't preserve the color saturation. And I think this may have come from one of the tests that Pablo did. And if you look at those dashers, the, when the color clips and goes wrong, you can see that that looks wrong uh, on that bottom image. And that, you know, we have a whole slew of examples that we've used uh, you know, in the past to test to make sure our conversions were right with stuff like this. So, Part of the, the core basis of you know, the philosophy we talked about in the top left, everybody's seen that chart, so that if it exists in 709, it should maintain that inside that container as it goes up to HDR and as it comes down to HDR. We learned what probably two years ago, that's really easy to say, really hard to execute. So Nick and his partner Pablo are you know, some of the, uh, they helped us actually execute it. And what's interesting in that lower left-hand corner is that the primaries for both for RGB are actually slightly different between 709 and 2020. So you really, you really do have to be careful from that conversion. And we see a lot of devices just swing colors over to the primaries as it do, does the conversion instead of maintaining things even inside the uh, 709 container. In terms of the light levels, and you know we've we're following that 75% anchor point in HDR and gaining that dynamic range between 75 and the end of the sensor. And depending on the camera that, you know, ends at a different spot. But then as we come back to SDR, we're coming back at 95% and leaving a little bit of room for, you know, the compression of that dynamic range. And we believe that we can del deliver a better SDR signal by starting in HDR. And we, you know, the similarity to when we started doing shows in HD and delivered SD, uh, anytime you start with more and you can make intelligent decisions on how you get uh, to a smaller format, we think you can do a better job. As Pablo mentioned earlier, there's a, a lot of technology in our LUT3 from how you get from HDR to SDR and how that compression is happening of that dynamic range, which really makes it look as good as it does. Uh, next, you know, one of the things we found out, and I'm going to hand this off to Chris here. Chris and I were both standing in his lab looking at the exact same display and having a different reaction to the content on the display. And as you can see, like Chris and I have different eyes. Our eyes are different ages. Everybody's eyes interpret things slightly differently. 
And out of this conversation of like us making this interpretation, this led to, as Chris touched on earlier, we needed a way to objectively measure what we were doing and had and be able to graph it and demonstrate that outside of like just the, you know, this is what I see versus this is what you see. Because if we line five people up, they're all going to see different things. So from here, I'm going to, you know, Chris is going to tell us a little bit about these objective measurements, which really helped get us to where we're at. Yeah, so as, thank you, Michael. As, as Michael said, everybody might see a scene differently. They might have uh, uh, certain things that they prefer, like a great, uh, you know, more saturation in the image. So we really had to objectively measure uh, um, the color itself and the light itself. And there is a recommendation uh, called BT2124 that includes the mathematics for us to convert SDR, um, HLG, PQ, into a single space called ITP. And ITP mimics certain perceptual aspects of the human visual system. So in other words, we can plot uh, all of these different formats into, into one um, single plot. And if we look at that, this is ITP. We're converting PQ, HLG, SDR into, P, into PQ in a wide color gamut using this perceptual space ITP. And so then we can plot the color in, in a 2D plot and compare one LUT versus another LUT. We can also look at the color volume, which is the light and the color together. But through some work with um, in ITU with other color scientists, we also learned that we also have to measure absolute chromaticity. So to do that, we use U prime V prime. And we have a tool that we've commissioned uh, a plugin for the player is called Voya, and the, the, the plugin is a color metric plugin. It enables us to input the video and output all of this normal, all of these uh, plots using these two different spaces. So, this is an example of two plots. And what I wanted to show you is NBCU LUT1 on the left hand side, and it's actually plotting this pattern below. And we see the different colors, red, blue, green. And the triangle represents the, um, I'm sorry, the circle represents the original SDR source and the triangle represents the conversion. And if one is right over the other, then that's a perfect conversion because we're basically creating um, a perfect transition from, from one color to another. And the center of the plot represents white. So the farther out you go, the more saturation. So this is a display referred, uh, display light conversion. On the right hand side, we see a scene light conversion. And if you look at those triangles, they're diverging from the original. So the conversion is, is less saturated than the original. That's because we're converting from SDR into HLG and HLG inherently is less saturated that's what they call the natural look. So in order to preserve the original intent of the SDR into the HLG, we have to use a display light conversion. And I don't have the plots for the other way around, but there are similar rules that, uh, that allow us to convert the output while preserving the intent of the HLG production. Now, there are reasons to use scene light conversion um, and that is when you need to match the, HG, the HLG camera, uh, I'm sorry, the SDR native camera into um, HLG alongside a native HLG camera. So if we look at our plot number three, this is, this is an example of what Michael was talking about, where when we convert HLG to SDR, we reproduce the exact colors within BT2020. So the blue represents BT2020 primaries, the green represents BT709 primaries, and the red is our conversion. So when we get to the edge of what BT709 can represent in, uh, you know, for a BT2020 color, we skew over to the BT709 primaries to preserve as much saturation as possible. So again, the farther you get from the center, the more saturated you are. And this is a plot of the pattern that you see to the left. So we don't only plot one color um, and a single luminance, we're, we're plotting an entire range so that we can see that the LUT is converting 
um, accurately throughout the entire range. And, and this is a great example of the tools that like we had to build over the last couple of years to get us to where we are. Like the 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 pattern on the left is built by the Sar the team over at Sarnoff with Chris, and it's called Yellow Brick Road. And without that, we wouldn't have been able to do a lot of the work and then being able to show it on the right. And as Chris transitions to the next slide. The and I should just mention one other thing, and that is that um, uh, Dolby's uh, Jacqueline Pitlarts and Scott Miller helped us immensely with some of the mathematics that we used in order to um, then commission the color metric plugin. Um, and without it, we wouldn't have been able to do, uh, do these plots. And Chris, would it be Sorry. fair to say that this also helps since all the, the displays that are currently available have can't reach 2020, you know, color space. They're all either P3 or slightly limited. This gives us another way to objectively look at the work that we've done uh, without, you know, taking the variable of the display out. Yep. So we're actually measuring the file itself and um, what is ultimately possible dependent on the display's capabilities. Yeah. So the last thing we want to share that's also available on the link that uh, uh, will be available in that PDF is we've built a version of BT2111 bars and what we're calling out over on the left-hand side and uh, Pablo's uh, colleague Gert over at OBS may have started this with our, our friends at uh, Hitomi. This indicator helps when you're using the NBCU3 uh, to get to SDR. When it converts to SDR, you can see that that pattern shows up at 100%. So part of the challenges we're faced with and you know what we're doing at our major events now is we're producing an HDR and that derived SDR is going a lot of places. And people are accustomed to seeing things show up at 100%, you know, zero to 100 with your test pattern. So by adding this little indicator, it helps uh, anybody downstream of the production. So I think that's, you know, we had a couple sides of what things look wrong, but I think everybody's kind of experienced what they look wrong. So I think from here, Ken, we could go to questions. I've seen a whole bunch of them in the chat that there's a, there's a solid yeah. group brain trust, not me on this call to help answer. Sure. Well, let me ask a question too, because, um, you know, it was interesting on your, on your chart um, of the production, you know, with graphics. Okay. So let's, let's talk gra graphics a little bit. Um, Cause that, you, you didn't have HDR graphics. It said SDR. And so let's, let's just, let's just discuss as a group um, this challenge of satur you know, what is the saturation oversaturation? Like why not have HDR graphics? It seems like it would be an easy thing to do quote unquote, because you can match the colors that you're supposed to have, you know? Yeah. And this is a good conversation I've actually had recently with our graphics team. And one of the decisions we're making currently is we're going to continue to work in SDR graphics. We don't want an advertiser or anybody out of house to deliver us something that we can't deliver to the bulk of the viewers in SDR. So right now, continue to just work in SDR is uh, the mode we're working in. The other part is kind of the philosophy that we've adopted is that HDR is supposed to give you expanded dynamic range and color when available and when we're in an environment. So every environment that you're in might not have like all kinds of dynamic range in it. If you're in a well lit facility and you know, it's like, it's not in every scene, it's not in every shot. So if you then start to layer graphics on top of this that are brighter or, you know, what have, more chroma to them than you can experience. And it's like, all of a sudden, it's not going to composite into the overall show. Sure. But as we look at this show, it's like all these different elements have to pot composite together cohesively to, for the delivered solution. And right now with the philosophy, it's like, it's not supposed to be brighter than it is today. Like it's right. supposed to give you more dynamic range and color when available. So that's so, kind so of that's so, so on the graph, so back to the graphics thing. And so part of it is the commercial, you just don't want to have advertisers push back and say, we gave you, we gave you the graphic with our proper colors of the Coca-Cola, whatever. And when it ran on air, it was, you don't want to deal with that's all, that's the bigger issue, right? Yeah, if Billy Bob's car shop delivers us, you know, his logo that was created in 2020 color, and then he sees it on the 709 channel and it's not the same thing. And then he doesn't want to pay us for it because that's his brand. That right. that's a commercial problem for us that we're <laughs> gonna choose to stay away from. Gotcha. Okay, so stick to SDR for graphics. Everybody else agree? 
Pablo's well, it's, it's 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 easy that way, and I completely agree, absolutely one hundred percent, with um, what Michael was saying about the compositing and and the and the um, with with the we no longer have one white, and there is no white that is right. <laughs> is this the other way of looking at it? And you can end up with a very messy picture with five or different five different anchor whites in in the in the scene at the same time be the led wall match clocks and some graphics team shirts and the, the sky they're all different and um on one of my slides i showed a um the um the bt small logo which is actually a, a small graduated white area we did some experiments with with that a wipe a white wipe um which started out mid gray became full white in the middle and also um, as a large area white graphic that they have. And we just gave the controls to one of the shaders and said, just tweak the Kahuna Procam until it looks about right, please. Um, and we found they needed a different setting for each of the three or four different areas of white in order to get a pleasing blend. So it, there's a whole different kind of class of um, problem, if you like, that Michael's alluding to there. And in how do you create an appropriate um, graphics rich with with and what is the appropriate um, brightness level of a graphic which will vary by its size and and, and colors and that's quite a complicated um, um, problem the other thing is that all the graphics operators right now they're, they're used to entering in rgb in sdr numbers and you've got to provide them a whole new set of numbers <laughs> and, and you've got I, to, yeah, which, which, so, which, which, which is doable but but it's well, i'm not as i'm not a, we're doing a bunch of AR VR stuff and some upcoming HDR productions and talking about where lighting interacts with it and where the lighting is. And there we are playing with letting the lighting interact with those elements above that 75% anchor point or 203 nits, because that's what's natural for that scene. So it's, but we're always cognizant of like that operator will see the predictive down convert of what that scene looks like before we do it because we're not going to do something that doesn't look good in sdr right all right so let's let's so, roll through some questions from the audience shall we um andrew from bristol connecticut have no idea what company he may work for um <laughs> how is it, is it possible to have any type of end-to-end -end slash complete live sports hdr broadcast production contribution distribution workflow that's a big one exclusively using only SMPTE Dolby perceptual PQ based standards transfer functions, meaning no HLG or S-Log3 conversions to Dolby Vision or HDR10 would be needed in the future at all. So end, end using PQ? Yes, it appears yes. yes. So right now, Sony doesn't support PQ on their broadcast cameras. Grass Valley does support PQ, uh, mm -hmm. but the question I guess is whether it's suitable uh, or necessary in a live production, because if you can't go above 1810 nits in the camera, then what are you actually accomplishing with PQ, which, is which supports 10,000 nits? So do you get better quantization using a different transfer function like S-Log3 or HLG? And I think the answer is yes. And I think that we can't predict the future. The future, we're gonna have a whole new version of what we're doing today that's gonna, you know, it will evolve in our lifetimes again. I think that it, to answer that question, it's really like you have to look at the production, all those different elements. So what Chris said, you could do pieces of it, but I don't think any of us want to be in that chair saying to production, hey, so we made this technical decision. Now you can't have this as part of your show. And we've all done enough shows to know that they're going to bring in something like, I'll be honest, at Super Bowl, there was things that showed up on site that we had no yeah, idea what's right. happened. Yeah, what's happened. And, and but for distribution, there's a different answer because for distribution, what you can do is you can provide consistency to the customer by then mapping to an absolute transfer function. It also gives you the ability to possibly put cinema content in to that same live, live linear ch uh, channel. Or if you have post-produced content that might have been shot with a cinema camera, you might be able to push that into the live linear channel and that content might have different capabilities that you can take advantage of in PQ. So the answer for production versus distribution is different. Gotcha. So just a quick follow-up to that, Chris. Um, we touched on this a little bit last week. You know, as far as uh, archived contents and stuff, so should you be taking archive stuff and and trying to, um, you know, if, it's SD, if it was SDR back in the day, try to, to convert it to HDR before you drop it into broadcast, or do you think it's okay to kind of let archive stuff um, be SDR within an HDR 
broadcast. I think you can, it can remain SDR. You don't want to requantize -quant mm -hmm. your sources and pre-convert them if it's unnecessary, because it may be in the future, there are better ways. For instance, Pablo was talking about a non-LUT uh, method of conversion, a mathematical conversion. You might be able to improve that conversion down, down the pipe. And so you can do a real-time conversion right now and use the original source um, and you don't have to keep two separate libraries. I guess right. it can happen real time. Yeah, my answer to that has evolved since our, like from converting from SDR to HDR, a lot of the times that archive content should look like <laughs> archive content and like the big event we're all going to Asia for, like there's trials and other stuff. The time it takes to find the content you want, convert it and deliver it to the production has to be factored into whether or not it's still relevant if you're doing it on demand. So that workflow is absolutely valid, but if it took, you know, too much time, uh, it's not valid in terms and, of- and, and, and to that point, I mean, that's why we had SDR deliverables to the truck because it was too hard to put the converter back at the base, get the production team to remember to convert it to HDR and send it to us because they've been doing it one way for the last 20 years. And, and it, was, it, was, it was just too difficult to get into change in operational practice, um, but in, in the in the uh, ultimate programs, all the advert breaks, the SDR adverts, which are converted, mapped via display light up to up to PQ, and then in, and cut live um, on the on the program. In the same way, the program is down converted to SDR, and the SDR adverts are cut in. So that that goes on in, out out on, on Red B on play out. So, yeah, right. and so, I would so say Pablo, that for us going to Tokyo, we'll have both. We'll have everything. Of, for example, came out of trials that production thinks they might need be ready to go at a moment's notice into those shows you know, as HDR. But if there's something in the deep archive, we could go get it and convert it and deliver it. Right. So Pablo, I'm going to bring in in here. This is because this question kind of I think um, from John from Heartland Video Systems kind of encapsulates I think where a lot of people are who aren't doing HDR, which is everyone's waiting for a perfect solution, right? Um, so the question is, has there been any consolidation of the different HDR standards yet? Any trends on which standard is the most popular or is moving towards that designation? Are there reasons to maintain more than one standard for HDR, perhaps in, perhaps in different markets? And I think this is a key question that everybody kind of struggles with, right? They're it, all waiting is, for- Yeah, it is a very good question. Uh, as Chris and Michael was saying, I think PQ for distribution is, uh, is a pretty good one. Um, we need to remember that also that uh, TV sets at home, they don't like changing of, uh, of standards. So if we keep that consistent, uh, especially most of the people I believe is uh, getting HDR over uh, either OTT or set a box or something like this. Um, I think the HLG has consolidated. I was not a big fan of it uh, at the beginning, but to be honest, the more I do it, the, the more I see it as, uh, as the go-to. Um, and in terms of the perfect transforms and so on, I mean, we're talking about mathematical calculations. There is no one single, there's not just one way of doing things in maths. You can get a similar result by applying a different set of maths. Uh, so it was a question over there about um, uh, TMOs and uh, the to mapping algorithms. And yeah, I mean, you can do it in a thousand different ways and getting a very similar result. Uh, the well, best I, way. Yeah, I was going to say your point, one of the things that Pablo and I have talked about, like what we've designed as you work in HDR is a box for the video guys to work in. Like to his point, two video guys are going to shade things differently. The lead video or lead shader for a show has his look and the rest of the room is going to do that. And that's the look that production is looking for. So this is a box to work in. This isn't saying that you're working in HDR and all our shows are going to look the same. You know, Pablo's got the hardest job of any of us of trying to keep, what, 60-something productions looking consistent in Tokyo. Uh, and that's really hard to do, as we all know, because everybody has a different look and their eyes are different. And they do their own thing. But, and it, it's really a box to work in, not uh, this is how it should look. Right. Yeah, because... Right. As you said, it, I mean, we need to separate. One thing is look, and the other thing is a technical conversion or a technical transform. In, in a color managed workflow, which is what we are talking about, we're talking about color management. We're talking about creative intent, which are two parts of color management. But 
they are different conversions or different transform for from depending on what. Um, Michael and Chris, they were talking about their approach to display light, which makes absolute sense. They rely a lot on graphics and they rely a lot on um, archive. The examples I was talking about before, we didn't have that problem at all. This other big event that is happening in the, this summer, that we're gonna go for a scene like conversion as well. We decided to that they, the graphics were extremely important, but we had the luxury of adapting the graphics. And we are not doing 100% white for graphics, we're doing 95% for graphics because we want to leave a little bit of headroom for them to, to play nicely and not to have any losses on the, on the run trip. So what comes in com comes out exactly the same. The important bit is to have the exact conversion, especially uh, in this case of the graphics. If you are doing display light up with the graphics, you must do display light down. So then you have that is seen light conversions only for the cameras, which is gonna screw up something in the, so that camera is not gonna look exactly how it will. Oh, we lost, lost Poland. That's just... <laughs> He had a different set of requirements in the productions and his deliverables than what like yeah. Chris and I have. Or, 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 or we did. We, we, we couldn't do that. So. Yeah. The, you know, the differences between a host broadcaster and then the end broadcaster. So the, the, one, the one thing I, I would add is that um, converting graphics and the program at the same time with live production is the hardest thing you can do. So a lot of the converters, the ones, certainly the early ones, were highly optimized for, for I, would, I would say, for movie production, where everything has been pre-graded. You don't get large <clears throat> dynamic ranges of, of, of change. Um, I was talking to um, uh, uh, one of the top LE um, and sports shaders in the UK, and he did the men's final at Wimbledon. And he had to, he resorted to auto iris because little dark clouds are scudding in front of the cloud. It's like an ND3 going in. Um, and, and, and he couldn't react fast enough. It's a very rare instance when he had to do that. But um, I mean, Michael's laughing because <laughs> he's seen the same thing as well. The, um, the, and, and if your, if your um, down mapper is not designed to give you plus or minus three stops of latitude and be hue invariant, and, and not turn the, crowd, the, the clouds brown or the grass blue within that range, then when you do throw that in, you will get a hue change on air because the, the, that dam mapping LUT or, or converter is not designed for live production. So well, that's one, you, one thing I'd to be, be aware of that. Is, so a similar question that, um, and maybe this is um, just expanding on that. A question regarding leaving the iris, mostly alone in HDR due to the expanded dynamic range as a shader and one of the people controlling how the picture looks, do I really want an 800 nit APL screen blasting everyone at home, quotes, because the sun came out from behind a cloud, the picture is still within the specs, but the creative intent gets thrown away. So that was a comment, similar, I guess. I, mean, I, I would say like any composition of image, whether you're a shader or a colorist, you have, you have to decide you know, what that focal point is and what it looks like. So. Uh, what we have seen in practice is that holding the dynamic range in the background instead of having it just get blown out and clipped out looks a lot better than, you know, what I think your concern was to that, like, it would draw away from it. I think the focal point still stays as the focal point. Right? Yeah, we didn't talk about the anchor point, which I think is mm. a very, uh, uh, an important point for any broadcast uh, HDR production. Pablo's back. Come back, Pablo. It's better hey, there he goes. <laughs> that was pretty embarrassing. Uh, but yeah, my even though that I have everything connected, my battery has decided to die. Oh, so, sorry. Welcome back. So uh, here's here's a question. Um, hopefully, this is a simple one. Um, when using HLG or PQ, are there different are there different LUTs for for HLG or PQ? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, so we uh, commissioned several LUTs through Pablo and Nick's uh, company uh, that do the exact same light level mapping, but preserve the artistic intent going uh, in and out of each or either HLG or PQ. They use the same uh, knee principles, but 
but they're using different transfer functions, so they have to be uh, separate lines. Yes. All right. Yeah, yeah we, we need to understand uh, that um, we have, when we're doing a conversion like this, uh, we are not only doing tone mapping, we are doing uh, color space transform. Color space are gamut and EOTF. So technically, we are not only talking about two different standards, we're talking about moving two different color spaces. A PQ2020 is a different color space than a HLG 2020 as a color space. So we are actually moving volumes into one to another. So there are some peak colors that could be slightly different. That's because we use this max RGB actually to do all the mapping from one color space to the next one uh, that Chris was talking about. And the cool thing about Pablo's tools is that they actually were able to give us the right GUI, a, a graphical control, so we could design our own E. Um, which was powerful for us because we had certain things that we wanted to actually get into the LUT and their tools allowed us to design our own. Yeah, and, to, and to Prince's point, the knee was key because what happens in the yeah. background and like so much work went into that knee with our video guys to make sure that it was natural and like you, they're trying to shade too many cameras. So, so one of them's gonna get brighter and it's really like the working in HDR has actually helped them because of how good that knee is in that lot. And, and and I think I think also that's a secret to making your your system work with the the ninety five percent point. Um, that's absolutely that, 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 that yes. knee combination is 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 absolutely key. So, so it seems so it seems like just a general I guess philosophy tip for everybody out there. You know, NTSC was always you know never the same color twice kind of a thing, right? So um, it seems you know, now and as a layman. I would have thought that HDR, I'm like, this is great. I finally will have the absolute right color for X, Y, or Z. It seems that people who are chasing that dragon are gonna be always disappointed, correct? Is that simple? Not really. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far because um, to be honest, the full gamut of 2020, I don't think we're ever gonna see it. Uh, the 95% of pointers gamut, which is, uh, it covers most of the naturally reflective colors in nature, trees, um, fruits, skin tones, and everything. It's about P3, it's slightly larger than, than P3. The, those primaries of, of 2020 gamut, and with the tone mapping and 10,000 nits and uh, things like that, you don't achieve that. It's, uh, it's unachievable, but a, a green laser. Are we gonna really talk about the artistic intent of a green laser in the background in some fireworks or something like this? I don't think so. The the, the rest, it can we can move it. Right. What I would consider to all these paranoia of no, we want the 2020, uh, we want to do it fully and so on. No, you don't. What you do to do is as good as you can, at least P3. Going a little bit of the boundaries of, uh, of a P3D65, that's, uh, that's totally fine. But that's what you really want to do because that's what the people are getting at home on the, best, on the best cases. That's what a consumer TV can do. Even the 30K monitors that we have, they don't do all the 2020, it's impossible. I have a projector here in the cinema that does the green primary of 2020. And you cannot imagine how fluorescent that is. It's just, it's just it's unreal. It is. I mean, I, I've seen some Pixar rendered content for laser projector, um, um, mm. which is, which is astonishing, actually. Uh, with the, what they, what they, what they, what they did with that uh, has nearly a ninety-eight percent coverage of twenty twenty. That's right. Mm. Yeah, but, <laughs> not with the luminance, so but somebody, it's, uh, it, it's insane. Somebody asked about, so can, can you talk about the importance of the ST352 payload ID and what devices care about the correct flags? Yeah, so I'd like to point everybody to a document called ITUT Series H Supplement 19. And what that is, is it's a, it's a summary of 47 different standards that uh, identify how you signal HDR, um, SDR, your color primaries, transfer functions, and matrix coefficients. So it covers SDI, MXF, uh, QuickTime, 
and HEVC. So you can understand how to pass on that information and identify your content, whether you're baseband or file based. And uh, NBC uh, has encouraged all their vendors to support this signaling, um, whether it be a file based software package or a hardware based converter so that we can automate as much as possible throughout the entire workflow. And much of that signaling is, is in ST2110. Um, and that's also, mm -hmm. I, I forgot to mention, is identified in that document as well. One thing I would, and this is a plea from the heart, mm -hmm. is that um, what we haven't talked about is extended range, um, and particularly with, with HLG, is that please do not, implement, when you use extended range, do not signal it as full range. Oh, yeah. yeah, because it just causes that would mayhem. Be bad. That is bad. <laughs> Thank you. Please, people, don't do it. It's, you really don't want to do it. It's, 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 oh, and that's a good point because in our LUTs, we also include resolve LUTs that identify video signal range with a full, full range payload. So in other words, using extended range, but with video, video range content so that all of it is, is LUT converted. Here's another question. How do you manage the colors in the non-overlapping regions between the REC 2020 and P3D65? Have you experienced any issues in the past because of that region? The, sorry, the overlapping? Non-overlapping. Oh, Non-overlapping. The, the bits are outside, the bits are outside P3. Outside um, um, the bits outside of P3, the, I would say the toughest thing to manage is constant hue through luma so that you maintain the hue while you turn up the the luminance of uh of those colors so um, yeah i would say that that's the that's the most complicated thing and i think we're talking about for example a, a marshall's a fluorescent colors artificial human made uh colors well of, uh, you, you say that the uh, i can tell you the um the tottenham hotspur uh, warm-up strip one for you ken um yeah. is, is outside <laughs> p3 <laughs> the cyan the, the br bright cyan the a really strong barcelona has also like a really strong pink yeah that's uh, right the, the, the goalkeeper pink this is a, this yeah, yeah that was that, that was that was going bananas and uh some of the nike boots as well um to be honest the uh, those are tricky to to handle but it's more on the luma than in actually the hue of that color is how to how to bring it in with uh with actually there's one thing we not talked about and that's the taking characteristics of the camera so just because uh -huh. the display at the consumer it may be p3 and just because our color space that we're using is 2020 the camera is taking characteristic i the cam the gamut of cameras sorry the gamut of colors that the camera can acquire is somewhere in between and it depends yeah. on the camera settings um, and That's it varies it. and it varies with camera manufacturer and if, and a single chip camera using bare filters versus a three chip which is using um there's only a couple of dichroics manufactured in the world and they have quite similar characteristics so um an sdr camera that has been adopted adapted for HDR uh, 2020 operation, its dichroics are fundamentally limited or optimized for, for 709 production. Uh, yeah. Ideally, you would have two sets of dichroics, but you couldn't have cameras that switch in that case. And, and single chip cameras, so it's, it's quite normal to use an F55 for camera one um, for a whole bunch of reasons, which we can talk about if you want to. Um, I think HBS use that, BT Sport do as well. I think um, Sky in the UK do. Um, and they, do have, they have a different ca taking characteristic. And so you will get different gamuts out of, yeah. out of the different cameras and different camera manufacturers. A... The, the gamma acquisition of an F55 is way wider than a 4300. 100, yeah. And made a, an, a, a fantastic point. And um, yeah, the how the camera is handling those colors is probably the best, the, the most important, <laughs> important piece. piece. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so last question, and then, because I appreciate it, we went over by a half hour, this is great. Great conversation. Um, let's tie it all together with the other big trend in the industry, ST2110. Um, you know, is there an impact of ST2110 on work on, on HDR workflows? If you're, uh, how will metadata, HDR metadata to be preserved within a 2110 workflow? I would say that to start with impact, we have multiple 2110 environments doing HDR uh, in, you know, under, you know, I guess our direction. And then 
uh, without singling anybody out, I'd be very careful about the metadata and how it gets between, you know, source and destination devices, the handshaking that in, you know, the utopia of NMOS and whether or not that actually is a utopia. Um, but that's a panel unto itself. Uh, <laughs> it, but I will say it does work. And uh, to date, we're not doing anything to drive any downstream anything based on metadata. So we will make sure that what leaves is stamped correctly, but inbound and support from various vendors is not consistent. So fair enough. That's great. Nice. Hopefully it will be hopefully it will be, it will one, be day. one day. That's right. right. And 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 I'd, I'd agree that the systems we've been using, there is no dynamic metadata. In fact, there's no metadata at all in the entire chain. Um, and the final encoders, um, I based on some statistics I'd gathered over the, the years, came up with the um, the static metadata um, parameters that we, we put in the, uh, I think they were elemental encoders at the, at the time, and they're the ones that we, we, we've gone with. As I said. Yeah, I remember the Dolby and uh, at, in Russia having uh, a hell of a lot of, uh, yeah, how to encode that in real time and how to make that work. It's, uh, it's a complicated one. My dream always has been that the actual tongue mapper, et cetera, leaves on the consumer TV. That's what it should be. So, so we just transmit one single one single thing, regardless of SDR or HDR. So that conversion happens on the on the consumer side, which is a way that we do similar to on monitor calibration, et cetera. We just do the tongue mapping in the, the display. Right. Excellent. Well, Pablo, thanks so much for everybody for your time. Hopefully see you in Tokyo. My plans are to get there and see all the stuff in person. Kevin, yeah. you want to take us out? No, I'd just like to thank everybody for your time. Um, yes, we have overrun, but I think it was a fantastic conversation. And um, hopefully the takeaway everybody has from this is it can be done. It's, it's there. It's happening. You're going to see it this summer. That's a cool person if you don't like sports anything like that but it's happening yeah and we've been there the two of us <laughs> so thank you very much everybody for joining us um thank you, kevin if you have any questions on that we will be publishing a q a summary of this event and um good luck with your productions going forward and if you have any questions the team are available here and we can answer them as you come across them on your productions yeah, we're here to help you succeed. So definitely reach out if you have a question. And yeah. download our recommendation. Or we'll answer any of your questions. Thank you. Uh, and, and in Europe as well, probably UK, happy to reach out and um, certainly gives it's, it's free advice. Go for it. So you can do it. Sounds great. Thanks again, everybody. Stay safe. Take care, everybody. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.